Deloitte's The Insight Track is developed to prep you and your organization for the ever-changing future. It provides insights into the agility you'll need to do sustainable business. This podcast series dives into the six agility domains necessary for Belgian companies to stand up to future crises. Please welcome our Inside Track host, Gudula Veynans, Director of Deloitte Belgium. Welcome at a new episode of our Inside Track by Deloitte. In today's episode, we will have a look at how real time data and insights can help your company to become a more agile organization. We will focus today on a forward looking perspective and what kind of financial data and insights you need in order to become a future-proof company. From the Belgian Readiness Report, we learned that only 30% of the respondents have an efficient and sufficient automated forecasting process. That means that 70% is not satisfied with the processes or the tools they use to do the forecasting. But there is a way to improve that. And that is what today's episode is all about. And that is why I invited today uh, my colleague Johan Buzini, director at Deloitte Belgium, um, an expert into this matter. Johan, uh, can you please uh, introduce yourself to our audience, please? Thank you, Goodele, for having me on the show. So indeed, I'm Johan Buzini, director in what we call finance and performance uh, service line, and I'm leading the business finance uh, team. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm focusing uh, a lot on supporting companies to transform the way they plan from a process and a solution perspective. Okay, so thank you anyway for joining us. Can you explain, perhaps to start with, why 70% of the Belgian companies, which we saw in, in, in the readiness survey, are still not happy about the process or the tools uh, that they use to do the budgeting process today? Um, what is wrong, according to you, uh, with the traditional way of forecasting? First of all, if we look at the traditional pain point, the first one is budgeting process remains a very manual process. You, mm -hmm. sti you still see a lot of customers uh, using Excel, using email to exchange the, the latest view on the budget, which you can imagine quickly turns into an Excel nightmare, right? Second of all, finance departments still tend to collect a little bit too much uh, financial performance indicators, so the PNL and the balance sheet, but without the underlying drivers. And when I talk about underlying drivers, it could be the volume, the prices, the number of FTEs. So the, the drivers that afterwards would, uh, will allow you to mm -hmm. do uh, financial, um, what if analysis, uh, sorry. Um, the planning itself starts too early and it takes too long. We often see customers, uh, clients and companies uh, starting the budgeting process from the summertime or right after summer and taking four to five months uh, to get to the final view and the agreed view on the budget, which of course, by the time you reach, is an outdated budget. Fourth, it's built in isolation. Function tend to still uh, look at it, look at themselves only and their own context to build the budget, which means that down the line, when you start putting all the pieces together, you might, uh, of course, discover gaps that were not identified mm. before, which force to another iteration of the budget. And fifth, but that's still important, the incentives in between the different functions are not always uh, aligned, resulting in either competing um, needs or uh, even, let's say, uh, suboptimal uh, decision-making process. I understand that. And of course, we cannot uh, really look into the future, but I assume there are better ways uh, for our companies to plan their sustainable future and who could eliminate those pain points, I assume. <laughs> but first of all, it's a change in mindset. Huh? Uh, the value of planning comes from forecasting where are you going and what is the impact of the change in market conditions, right? In order to either best avoid negative impact or make the most of, uh, of opportunities. Mm -hmm. So if we look at an example during COVID, retailers uh, that, if, that could switch quickly towards an online retailing platform or that were already starting to do that, 
they have been the ones suffering the least from the from the crisis COVID, uh, of COVID and making even in some cases uh, profit out of that or gaining a competitive advantage uh, when out of the out of the crisis. So the idea is to spend less time on the nitty gritty detail of uh, planning and rather look at the big ticket and big ticket items, the key really performance indicators that you have, because that's where your uh, organization should focus, spend the time to make the impact that matters. It comes as well uh, with a change, of course, in management processes uh, that needs to probably be uh, applied. So, for example, um, traditionally, planning and forecasting follow a very strict uh, calendar. But in fact, if the condition, market condition or the assumptions are not changing, why would you start uh, replanning from top to the bottom and involve your organization for four months in that process? It might not be necessary, right? So start focusing and start shifting the attention towards a more event-based uh, approach. And that's what we've seen coming uh, for quite some company during COVID. Market condition was changing so much, they wanted so much to have a view on their uh, on the financial results that they started forecasting and understanding that having that even based uh, forecasting was the most uh, valuable. The next point I think uh, which which is important to mention as well is we still come and we still see uh, customers and companies uh, working on absolute targets, so do X percent better than last year. But that is that might be uh, not the most uh, relevant measure, and a relative target might be more important. If the market goes down, like we are seeing it now, having a a, um, a target that is what is the market share that I'm gaining or, or losing against my competitor, regardless of where the market is going, a much better indicator of mm -hmm. my true performance, yeah. and I will be to able to recover after uh, the the crisis has passed. Another example, maybe, for more admin functions, huh? uh, like a finance function, having only a target into reducing the cost base of the company might not be, again, the most relevant. If your business is booming, that uh, you're, you're doing a lot more sales than, than, uh, than before, yeah, there's going to be an extra administrative burden on that, uh, on that department. So it should rather be a target which is a proportion of uh, the sales. Right. Okay. So those two small examples. Yeah. Okay. Can you explain a little bit how does that really materialize uh, in practice for our customers and prospects? The first element uh, that we see more and more and that we are also preaching for ourselves is the adoption of the rolling forecast. And adopting the rolling forecast means, first of all, expanding your planning horizon, looking, looking always at the next 12 to 18 months uh, mm -hmm. forecast that you have. And one of the key benefits of doing that is that you stop only looking to the forecast up until the, the end of the year. You're actually constantly reflecting on where you are going in the next 12 to 18 months. Okay. Ultimately, you should try and abandon the, the, the budget process, of course. But we understand that uh, there, there are expectations from the market, expectations from shareholders to still keep that. But voilà, it's it's a first reflection into, uh, in, into looking forward. And... Because you start doing a rolling forecast more frequently and that there is a substantial amount of data uh, to plan, the key is to focus on materiality and volatility. You need to uh, focus your organization and your organization should spend time where it matters, not only generating a huge amount of numbers. Okay, so I understand that your recommendation is to focus on less but on the ones who have more impact. So less on the details, but really on the big KPIs companies have. Is there any way to automate this process and, and to speed up the process as such? But, so what we see developing uh, more and more and where we have implementing it in practice in the private sector, but also in the public sector, uh, is predictive algorithm, artificial intelligence, machine learning type of algorithms. And fundamentally, those techniques, they leverage uh, patterns from the past mm -hmm. to predict the future. 
So for example, based on your contract and on your client, you can have a, a very detailed cash forecasting that can be generated. Or if you regularly introduce new product in your lineup, looking at introduction of previous product might be a good way to start and predict uh, what the impact will be. All assumption being equal, uh, mm -hmm. of course. But you need to find the right business case to use those algorithms. For example, if you're a company doing a lot of acquisition divestments, then you might not be in the right context with the right data to use uh, predictive algorithms or machine learning algorithms uh, to, get, to get to a reliable result. The key here is the availability of data and the quality of the underlying data so that those techniques can be used at their best and that the reliability of the, the result that they produce uh, can be proven to your organization. Because, of course, one of the key uh, aspect that we see at client is that the resistance of some of some parts of the organization to trust those algorithms. For example, at a client where we in, uh, implemented uh, a year and a half ago, uh, it took two to three quarters uh, for the entire organization, and you know there are always some people change uh, that are a little bit resistant to change, to get convinced and proven that the uh, algorithms is actually generating as good as a result, if not a better result, uh, than the manual exercise. So ultimately, how to use those algorithms in a rolling forecast process, it's very often to generate a baseline so that people don't start from a blank sheet, but that the machine is already generating what is likely to happen based on, uh, on past uh, assumptions and conditions that afterwards uh, planners can, of, of course, refine. That's, that's why they are there for and in some extreme circumstances, we also seen that for some specific parts of the planning, uh, the, the intervention from uh, humans was completely removed because once the trust in the, in the algorithm is set, you can really start leveraging it to wide scale. So, Johan, I, I hear you talking about uh, the importance of change management if, if you want to do that kind of projects that people need to let go the old way of, of, of doing um, the planning and trust algorithms. Uh, that's one thing. You also talked about um, the different business units and functions working in silos. What could be a solution uh, for that, you think? So, and, and we need to look a little bit back. Um, so, historically... FP&A solutions, so financial planning and analysis mm -hmm. solution, uh, were used, of course, by the finance organization and were very disconnected and unintegrated with the operational plan. And that was mostly due to technical limitation. The databases were too slow and the integration in between the system was somewhat Processes. difficult, oh. right? So what we see coming from the vendors like SAP uh, is a new era of uh, solution which we can call a plat platform-centric approach. So the new terminology used by Gartner now is the extended planning and analysis. And by uh, bringing that new platform uh, to life, the vendors are proposing to use one and single umbrella to have the different planning of the organizations from sales to commercial to supply to finance sitting on the sale platform and seeming, seamlessly uh, communicating with each other, right? So, of course, best-of-breed solutions are st still going to exist, but studies show that uh, the trends for uh, companies that are transitioning to a new uh, way of planning, uh, they are incorporating that new platform-centric approach to best benefit from the integration and to create a process which is integrated in between finance and the other uh, functions. Okay, so and what are then the benefits of those kind of enterprise-wide business planning? Well, first and foremost, as I said, you're sitting on one technology platform. You avoid having five different silos of information uh, on your systems. Second of all, it allows you to have a centralized data model, so to share the same master data, to same, share the same hierarchies, for example, and that across all the domains of your organization. Which means, and that's a fundamental difference, in terms of scenario planning, you actually are finally in a position where a planner, sitting in whatever function, can 
play a scenario which will, which will have the impact on the other function and where it can easily collaborate with the colleagues from the different function to see collaboratively what is the impact that the scenario will have on the result of the firm. Those platforms as well, um, they benefit from the new technology we just discuss, discussed uh, just above, the predictive analytics, the AI. The, it's now all embarked and embedded into those platforms SAP, for example, has it as well with uh, the inclusion in their financial planning application of uh, a predictive uh, algorithm uh, that are for use uh, immediately uh, embedded in the in the application. Okay. I think if we if we look at uh, the the entire journey and moving to those platform centric uh, capabilities, what will it change for the for the for the for the companies? It's it's going to in- increase the speed. It's going to increase the transparency. It's going to increase the accuracy, of course, the alignment between the function and ultimately the efficiency of the way you plan. Qualitative data uh, seems really a must for companies to become an agile company. Uh, We will elaborate more on that uh, in our next episode of the Inside Track. Um, But when I hear you talking right now over all those benefits... What is keeping then the Belgian organizations away to move really to that extended planning and analysis paradigm? Well, we talked about the technology. Yeah? This is starting to be out of the way, let's say. Now the technology exists uh, to support that kind of process. Of course, the next challenge is more of an organizational challenge. As we discuss along the, this, uh, this podcast, uh, we are changing the management process. We are looking at integrating different functions uh, to work together. We are looking at changing slightly roles and responsibility across the organization, at uh, changing the way target, targets are set, reviewing KPI, and so on and so on. So it can't be all done at once. Uh, and as Deloitte, the, the, the recommendation that we typically do is to, to go for a very simple five-step approach. Very intuitive, but nonetheless very powerful. So first of all, it's a new vision, and that's a vision that you need to uh, create for your own organization, right? So it's a vision where not only finance should define, but where you should already include the top management and ensure that you have the alignment across the function. So which change is important. Change is important. It's the first one, is getting that, that proper vision. Once you have the vision, you turn that into a roadmap. And what is the key difficulty about the roadmap is to prioritize the use case. But that's the most important. You need to be clear that you can't climb the Everest in one day and you need to take baby steps huh, mm-hmm. to, uh, to make that successful for yourself. You need to talk about, uh, think about the people that you will involve. You need to t- think about the processes that you're going to change and how the technology is going to support that. Once you have the roadmap in place, once you have the visibility on what you want to reach, then start with a pilot. Don't try and implement the all shebang in one, de- in one go. Start with a pilot, demonstrate the new capabilities in practice, validate as well that the value generation that you are expecting for your organization is proven. And once the success can be demonstrated, then you will see that your organization and the other departments are probably going to be looking forward to get engaged in that vision because they see the success. And then when that success is created, then you can start industrializing. So it's refining the pilots, of course, uh, and it's to scale the capabilities around those pilots so that it can incorporate the lesson learned and it can be uh, rolled out to the entire organization. And very importantly, and you touched upon it uh, already, uh, ensure that the key leaders of the different function are involved and are sponsored sponsors of that transformation, of that change. It is key for the organization to accept the change and to be willing to go towards mm-hmm. that new direction. We covered uh, quite some topics today uh, and certainly how uh, a rolling forecast adds agility to companies and, and that's really the way to go. Um, but to the end, do you have one other trend you see uh, in performance management today? 
Well, what we see is that uh, sustainability performance management is uh, getting on the agendas of the CFO. Uh, they are taking an important role in that uh, sustainability uh, journey that all companies mm -hmm. are going through. Uh, the targets are set. The objective towards 2030 or 2050 are clear for most of the company. Now it's about providing visibility on whether we are achieving uh, or not those targets and creating a plan or helping the, the company to create a plan so that there are measurable short-term objectives that can be worked across. Okay. A good example that we did last year at a client, uh, they have that ambitious uh, target to reduce their carbon emission by 55% by 2030. So that's quite, mm -hmm. quite a short term. And so in order to do that, not only do they compute and disclose their, the, the, the progress and the carbon emissions that they are doing on a quarterly basis, but they've also developed a plan across the value chain, so across the different function, and making the link with, of that plant with the investment plant that is done from a financial perspective. Okay. And not only did they do that, do that, and where the CFO is, of course, uh, playing a, vi a very active role, uh, to make it even more tangible, they decided to translate that um, the, the impact of carbon reduction through what they call an internal carbon fee, which is a, a monetary impact on the functions P&L, so that it's extremely clear across the organization and it's a very... It's a true incentive for all functions to move towards that. But you see, having that centralized function that is taking that responsibility and that orchestration view is something and a trend certainly that we will see more and more in the coming years. Uh, Johan, it's really interesting that you mentioned that uh, sustainability performance management because uh, in our second episode, the previous one of the Inside Track by Deloitte, we all talked about uh, how sustainability adds uh, value f to become an, an agile company. So perhaps you might want to look at it later on. Anyway, I would like to thank you for your presence over here and explaining us how our customers and prospects can become more agile in terms of planning and budgeting. Thanks. Thank you, Goodle, for having me. Bye-bye. Thank you all for checking in on this inside track on the rolling forecast. I hope you learned as much as I did today. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you back at our next episode. Bye-bye. You're now one step further on the inside track to agility. Want to know more about the six domains that will strengthen your organisation? The Belgian Readiness Report is freely available. Be sure to tune in to the next episode of the Inside Track to keep broadening your way forward.